Hello. How's everybody doing? Good. Good. Okay. Uh, well, I'm Jordan. I'm here on behalf of Hamid to talk to you about our paper, The Theory Practice Gap is Generative Metaphor. And I wanted to start the presentation by summarizing the main contributions, just in case you're not able to stay through the whole thing. So there's really three things that we do in this paper. First, we offer an interpretation of the theory practice gap as a generative metaphor, as the title suggests, and we draw on Donald Shun's work um, to do this interpretive work. We describe the emergence of the gap in HCI research. We examine how it's been developed and understood and what its possible limitations might be. <clears throat> Excuse me. And finally, we propose a new metaphor, the continuum, as a way of reframing our understanding of theory and practice. So I want to start out by making sure we're all on the same page uh, with regard to what generative metaphor is. And it seemed to me that a useful way to do that would be to share with you the story that Donald Shun tells uh, when he illustrates the concept. And it's a story about paintbrush bristles, which is very exciting stuff. Um, he tells a story about a team of researchers and designers who are attempting to develop a synthetic bristle that performs just as well as or better than a natural bristle. But of course, things are not going well. They're hypothesizing about how to make a better synthetic bristle. They're comparing synthetic bristles with natural bristles and observing the differences. Um, for instance, they note that natural bristles have split ends. So they try making a synthetic bristle that has split ends, but that doesn't solve the problem. It doesn't yield any effective insights. Until at some point in this process, one of the members of the team in a moment that comes across as kind of just a moment of sheer inspiration says, you know, a paintbrush is a kind of pump. That observation sets the team off on a new path. They start observing different features of paintbrushes. So they notice the space between bristles rather than the bristles themselves. They characterize those spaces as channels and they observe then that the synthetic bristles actually have to act as facilitators or pumps to move paint through those channels. And after this, they also notice that when you press a synthetic bristle up against a flat surface like a wall or a ceiling, um, they have a sharp curve to them. It doesn't have a gentle curve, and that might be getting in the way of paint flow. So they develop a bristle that has a gentle curve, more like a natural one, and that works, or at least it produces a smoother flow of paint. I don't know if it performs as well as a natural bristle. And of course, we're not concerned about bristles here. Uh, I haven't seen any smart bristle presentations at the conference, but who knows what's coming. Um, we're concerned about generative metaphors, and what this story illustrates is what generative metaphors do for us. So they create new perceptions, new ways of seeing things, um, new explanations for how those things work or how they don't work, um, and they inspire new inventions. So they organize features of reality for us, the bristles in relation to the space between the bristles. They describe what's wrong, so the bristle has a, a sharp bend instead of a gentle curve and it gets in the way of paint flow and that sets a direction for a future transformation. So a synthetic bristle that curves gently and facilitates paint flow. Good stuff. Crucially too, generative metaphors develop over time. So when that researcher, the first one to observe that a paintbrush is kind of like a pump, they didn't have to say right then how, what, what the nature of the similarity was. That came later. It may have come much later in the process. Um, Shun is pretty light on, on the details of development in the story. Um, but it's enough to know that when the metaphor was proposed, it wasn't proposed in much detail. And so we can understand the theory practice gap in HCI in a similar way. Now, we don't know who the first person, when I say we, I mean myself and Hamid, don't know who the first person was uh, to bring the gap metaphor into HCI. We know one of the earliest examples that we could find in our reading uh, of something that sounds a lot like the gap was in 1985 uh, Kai paper by Keith Butler called Connecting Theory and Practice. I really love the title of the paper. Um, it establishes this relationship between theory and practice. It implies a disconnect. In the paper itself, I believe uh, 
Keith frames uh, a case study, partly in response to frustrations that were felt by software developers and cognitive science researchers who were privy to the CHI conference. Um, and he proposes a need for what he called guiding structures, <clears throat> sounds a lot like bridges, guiding structures that would enable cognitive scientists to produce research that was more pertinent and easy to use for software developers. So we can see kind of the same thing happening with the metaphor just in this paper. Right? It organizes features of reality, theory and practice. It describes what's wrong. Research is not pertinent or easy to use. And those descriptions set a path for future transformations. <clears throat> The gap is a fairly broad metaphor, though. So there's, there's some room for interpretation. There's room for different descriptions of what might be wrong, what might be undermining the relationship between theory and practice. And in the paper, um, we discuss a few, I guess you could call them dominant themes of what's wrong um, that might be contributing to the gap. So I'm going to summarize some of those kind of quickly for you now. One of the things that might be wrong is communications. This is similar to what Butler wrote about, but it's been written about in more contemporary work as well, um, that researchers are not communicating findings in a way that makes them understandable and applicable to practitioners. Another problem is practitioner constraints. So this could mean that practitioners don't really have the, the time uh, to engage with academic work, or they don't have the buy-in from colleagues or, or managers to engage with this kind of work. It could also mean they don't have the money to access work that's stored behind a paywall. Uh, and abstraction, which is a really interesting one, and uh, one with a lot of currency, I think. So abstraction captures the idea that theoretical knowledge lives at this general level of understanding. And so because it's so general, it, it's not clear how it connects with practice. And just as we know descriptions of reality point towards future transformations, in the case of the paintbrushes pump, so too do they do that here. So we know that communication, if that's the problem, we can propose frameworks for scholarly writing that will help us make our findings more understandable and applicable to practitioners. Um, if practitioner constraints are the issue, then we can study practice. We can understand those constraints and propose ways to ease them. Um, and if abstraction is the problem, we can reduce abstraction. We can produce different kinds of knowledge so that the connection between theory and practice is, is clearer. And I think you can see evidence of that in um, intermediate level knowledge objects, like strong concepts, conceptual constructs, and bridging concepts. And we engage a bit more in the paper with bridging concepts. There are some other questions that we get into um, in more detail in the paper when we're tracing the development of the gap in the field. I want to run through some of those for you now, but I won't go into great detail. So one question is why researchers attend to some features of reality and not to others. Um, one, one thing that becomes clear when reading Shun is the important role that personal judgment plays in asking research questions and attending to different parts of research findings, for instance. So we, we, st we became curious about why, for instance, you would notice communication as a problem instead of abstraction, um, or that you wouldn't pay attention to financial limitation as a potential practitioner constraint. So another question, I think this is a really interesting and, and important one, is has the gap metaphor been effective and it seems that there are a few different ways that you could understand this question of efficacy. One of those is, um, has it been effective at bridging theory and practice? Uh, what has been the outcome of the bridges that have been proposed? Another way you can understand it, though, is has it been effective at generating and inspiring really interesting research questions and studies and papers? That one seems like a fairly clear yes, in my view. I'm not sure about the first one. The question that's probably the most important for um, our work later in the paper when we're proposing a new metaphor is what don't we see um, when we see things in terms of the gap? What is it that we miss? Um, so at least one of the things that we potentially miss are the continuities and the synergies that exist between theory and practice. And that might just be the nature of the thing. If, if we're being primed to look for disconnects, then we can miss where there are strong connections. It's also difficult to see that the 
gap is a lens, it is a way of seeing, and that means that there are other ways of seeing. And that's the opportunity that we seize on in the later portion of the paper. So we become interested in framing theory and practice in terms of different generative metaphors. So one that might draw attention to connections and synergies rather than gaps, cracks and fissures. And so the way we go about doing that is by applying a strategy of reversal. Um, and the, the simple explanation is reversal aims to expand our understanding of a phenomenon by flipping its center and its margin. So if theory and practice, if the relationship between those two things is the phenomenon we're trying to understand and the gap is kind of at the center of that understanding. What gets pushed to the margins? I've already kind of alluded to this. It's the connections and synergies. So with this in mind, we proposed the continuum metaphor as a new way of understanding the relationship in a way that emphasizes continuities and agreement and mutual harmonies. So one of the clear implications of proposing a metaphor like this is it really no longer makes sense to ask about bridging the gap, to ask how we can do that. That's not really a relevant question anymore. So we do explore in the paper what some kinds of questions could be. Um, for instance, we can start to identify um, points of synergy. And we think affordances might be a good kind of first example of a good synergy between theory and practice. We know that it's a, a concept that has been adopted and used. Um, by practitioners. We also know that it's a concept that has uh, theoretical interest. So what are the qualities that make it interesting and useful to both of those groups? Okay. Um, and more broadly, we can ask about how to leverage existing connections like affordances. Uh, in the paper, we also point to distributed cognition. We know that practitioners have written about distributed cognition as a useful theoretical object. Um, so how can we leverage existing connections to strengthen theory and practice? In the end, we, we think that there are three paths forward um, with the continuum metaphor. So one of those paths forward is bridge assessment. So there's been, there's been quite a lot of work that starts from the concept of the theory practice gap and ends with a proposal of a framework for scholarly writing or a different kind of knowledge object um, that might strengthen the relationship. But, in our view, we know a little bit less about what the outcome of those frameworks and knowledge objects has, has been. So have researchers been taking those frameworks and writing papers? And if so, what do practitioners think about those papers? Case studies of continuities and synergies seems like another really uh, important and interesting opportunity. So this is, means identifying successful points of synergy like affordances, like distributed cognition. I think this conference is a phenomenal example of a continuity between theory and practice. I've met and talked to a lot of people who are design practitioners, um, come from industry, and I've watched presentations by them. That's a really wonderful thing to see, and it, it really reaffirmed questioning, in my view, questioning the gap as, as a useful metaphor for framing the relationship. And finally, and, and this is a little bit newer, it's, it's underdeveloped in the paper, but thankfully it's developed in much, um, in much more detail in a book. As we were in the later stages of working on this manuscript, we came across a, a book that was published, I think it was published last year by MIT Press called Making Design Theory uh, by Johan Redstrom. And one of the claims that's made early in that book is that practice can be understood as a kind of theorizing, and that really resonated with our project as well. But if you have questions about that, I'd probably refer you to the book, not to our paper. So we proposed interpreting the gap as a generative metaphor in the paper. And we also introduced a new metaphor, the continuum, as a way of reframing our understanding of theory and practice. Um, one of the really interesting insights, I think, that comes from acknowledging that the gap is a metaphor is that the gap is made. We made it. That means it's something that can be iterated on, remade, or thrown away completely if we choose to do that. Um, that's not really our interest in the paper. Our interest, though, is to open a space um, for exploring different framing metaphors. So we know that there are others. The continuum surely isn't the only one. It may not even be the best one or a good one. But it's something that gets a discussion going about what the relationship is in, in a kind of a new way.
So with that, I'll say thank you and ask if there are any questions. Thank you. Any questions from the audience? Hi, uh, Dan Lockson, Carnegie Mellon. Um, it's very interesting, and I think there's, there's a lot there um, to, I guess, to get people to think about how their own research relates to practice in different ways. But I wanted the question of the continuum, and the continuum as a metaphor seems to me, it, like it's quite an abstract thing in itself. Like if I, you know, if I ask you to, what is a continuum? Yeah. Like what, how would you? Yeah, so the best answer I can give you is the Miriam, the start of the Merriam-Webster definition, which okay. I did look at yesterday, just in case anybody yeah, okay, asked yeah, me yeah, the yeah. question. <laughs> um, a coherent whole. Okay. I kind of like, I, I, I like that. Um, it, it, it blurs the boundaries between theory and practice, which I think is what we're trying to get at okay. anyway. I just, it's just that it seems like as a term, it's quite abstract. And if you yeah. stop a designer and say, you know, what, you know, tell me about continu a continuum as right. a metaphor for... I think it is an abstract metaphor. And, and I also, I sort of wondered, once we started doing this, though, to what degree the gap is also abstract, but because it's maybe, I don't, I don't even know what the right way to put it is. It's, it's a more manageable level of abstraction, the gap mm -hmm. metaphor. I can make sense of that kind of intuitively, and I do need to do a little bit more thinking about the continuum. So I think if there's a different way to capture the idea of kind of a coherent whole where there aren't really boundaries between these two things, um, that's really what we're after. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Cool, thanks. Um, thanks. Um, Anna, Northumbria University. Um, I was, I really liked the talk, but what made me wonder throughout is that it seems like you're speaking of, um, of this gap that exists between people. So there's practitioners and thinkers. Yeah. But there is this old saying, saying practice as you preach, so to say. So there is also the possibility that the, the thinker, the theorist, and the practitioner is in the same within the same person. And personally, I find it really hard to, when I, I'm the practitioner when I do my work and I make my products, but then as soon as I have to write up, I become this theorist. Yes. And I, I lose the link between the two. And I think the, the gap that is within myself would benefit also from one of these things. But I think they need to change slightly, like how the tactics of actually bridging the two. So could you reflect on how it would work for one within one person? The gap within one person. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. That's, that's not something that I had really thought that much about. But for me, that's an affirmation of, of the value of something like the, the continuum metaphor. It, if it's, it's still a perceived thing. Like, I think it, it's still a way of making sense of what you're calling these two sides of yourself. It's not a necessary way for you to do that. I think you could come up with different ways to relate practitioner you and theorist you. And, and that's really what we're trying to accomplish here, just on a, on a kind of broader scale. Then I would say write a, a second one with yeah. practical skills for the, the individual. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>